Welcome to the beginning of this new series on topology. In the coming videos, we'll be introducing the basics of point set topology. So that'll include, of course, the definition of a topological space. We'll look at special types of spaces, for example, house door spaces. Um, then we'll see how we can construct new topological spaces from old ones, for example, by forming products or disjoint unions. And then we'll look at the properties of connectedness and compactness. The main goal for this series is to um, build the groundwork so that we can later go on and look at algebraic topology. I'll be following a book called Introduction to Topological Manifolds by John Lee. So as the title suggests, this is a book on topology that focuses strongly on manifold theory. Because of this, it doesn't cover maybe all of the topics that a standard point set topology textbook like Munkries would do, but I really like the way it's written and it'll serve the goal of getting quickly to the point where we can look at uh, the notions of algebraic topology. What should you know in order to be able to follow these videos? Well, you should know uh, the basics of sets and functions. So you should know what a set is, you should know what a function is between sets, and you should have some basic knowledge of the Euclidean space Rn. So that's knowledge you would get from like a calculus course or something like that. You should, for example, know what a continuous real valued function is, and you should have some familiarity with equations and manipulation of equations and, and that sort of thing. Furthermore, it would be good if you knew already what an open set um, of uh, the Euclidean space Rn is, and what closed sets are, and maybe some basic facts about convergence of sequences uh, in, in Rn. We'll be defining all of the, the basic notions um, throughout these videos, but because many of the definitions generalize the ideas that were first developed in Euclidean space, it means that you might not understand um, what the definitions are trying to achieve if you don't know the corresponding notions in Euclidean space. Okay, so let's get started. In order to motivate the idea behind the definition of a topological space, I've presented here on this slide three examples of topological spaces you probably already know. The first space here on the left is R3, so that's just three-dimensional Euclidean space. And as you may already know, we can think about open and closed sets of this space and define uh, notions such as convergence of sequences uh, inside this space. For example, we might have this sequence of points, which I'm drawing as red dots, and maybe they sort of spiral and always get closer. And then we'd like to say that these red dots are converging towards, uh, towards some point in, in the space. And the way we do this in the case um, of the epsilon delta definition of convergence of a sequence is we take some small epsilon, which will be the radius of a ball that we draw around the point that's supposed to be the limit of the sequence. And then we say that the sequence converges to, to such a point if for any choice of radius, we have that as of some point in the sequence, all of the members of the sequence lie inside this ball. Notice that in this case, this ball is an open set of R3. So what we've done is we've define the convergence of a sequence in R3 in terms of open sets that surround the limit of the sequence. And this suggests that maybe we don't need the epsilon in the definition, maybe we can just talk about open sets without referring to distances or, or radii. The next space in green is what I'll be denoting S2, which is the two sphere. And here we're just thinking about the surface of, of this sphere. So there's no interior. So what you can imagine is that this is like the surface of the earth and we can't uh, fly or drill into the earth. So we're limited to living on the surface. So if you think about a person standing on the surface or you could think about an ant walking along the surface, then for that person, if the surface is large enough, it would seem like the person is actually, well, just standing on a plane. So I'll draw this like this. So this would be R2. And 
you should know this from personal experience, if you're just walking around on the surface of the Earth, it seems like, uh, well, the surface is flat. Unless you, know, you can see really far into the distance, and maybe if you have like an ocean where you can look very far into the horizon, you might be able to see the curvature of the Earth. So one question one could ask is, how is the, this surface, S2, different from R2? One difference is that if you're on the sphere, you can walk straight in one direction and continue on walking and end up back where you started. So for example, this person could uh, start walking in this direction and go around the back of the sphere and come back to where the person started. The corresponding property doesn't hold for the plane R2 because in the plane you can walk uh, well forever in, in any direction without ever returning to where you started if you keep on a straight heading. The third space that I've drawn is the torus, which I'll denote T2. This is the torus. And it again is a topological space that differs from the two spaces we saw previously. As with the sphere, we're just thinking about the surface of the figure that I've drawn. The torus is this donut shape, so this is like a, a, a tube that wraps back around on itself. So you could think of like a, a donut or a tire of a car. If we again picture someone on the surface of this torus, then locally the torus would also seem like the plane. However, as is the case with the sphere, this person could walk around and end up back where they started, even though they kept a straight heading all the time. Hence, globally, the torus isn't like the plane. We could now ask how the sphere and the torus relate to each other. So are there any properties of the torus that are not shared by the sphere? One such property is the following. If we imagine that the person who's walking along this surface is actually um, trailing a piece of thread, so that this dotted line is actually a piece of string, then we see that in the case of the sphere, this person will be able to, from the point where they're standing, they will be able to contract, so pull back this piece of string to where they started um, without getting, um, well, stuck on anything. So I'll draw this in a darker shade of purple. So we could have this uh, continuous deformation of this path back to where the person started. So you should think of these different shades of the path that I've drawn as time passing. And so you can imagine that the person is drawing this piece of string um, back to where they started, but while keeping the loop intact. However, in the case of the torus, if we imagine that this person has um, pulled a piece of string along where they uh, were walking, then in this case, the person wouldn't be able to pull it back to um, where they started while keeping the loop intact. Basically, this is because we've gone through this hole in the, in the torus, and this means that this loop is stuck and can't be continuously deformed back to where the person started. In fact, it's the case that no matter how you draw a closed loop on the surface S2, it can always be contracted back to a single point uh, continuously, while in the case of the torus, as we've seen, there's um, at least one way to do it um, where this isn't possible. In fact, there's another way that one can um, come up with a loop that isn't uh, contractible back to a point continuously, and this is by going around the hole in, a, in the other direction. Moreover, these two loops I've drawn on the torus are actually distinct in the sense that they can't be continuously deformed into one another either. All right, so I've given you some examples of topological spaces you might already be familiar with. And in fact, these also all happen to be manifolds. Moreover, I've tried to illustrate some of the ideas we'll be thinking about um, in this coming course. So that's ideas of, uh, well, describing certain phenomena in terms of open sets and trying to find um, features 
of spaces that allow us to uh, encapsulate their global properties. For example, the fact that the torus is distinct from the sphere because it has this hole. In any case, it will become a lot clearer what topology is all about once we get into the actual material, which is what we'll start with right now. Our first definition, which is in some sense the most important, is that of a topological space. One of the advantages of this definition that's at the same time a problem if you see it for the first time is that it's very general. What we do is we define a topology on a set X to be a collection of subsets of that set X. And this collection needs to satisfy three properties. First, the entire set X and the empty set need to be contained in this collection. Second, the collection needs to be closed under finite intersections. That means that if we take any finite number of subsets of X that are in the collection T, then their intersection also needs to be in T. And third, T needs to be closed under arbitrary unions. So that's if we take any arbitrary uh, number of elements of this collection T and take their union, then that union also needs to be contained in T. And point three is different from point two because we don't require the number of uh, well, elements of T that we union, we don't require that number to be finite. In terms of nomenclature, we call uh, T the topology on X, and we will call X, if it has a topology on it, a topological space. As I said before, this definition is very general. So if you're seeing it for the first time, you're probably having a hard time uh, imagining what, what all this is supposed to mean. So I'll try to give uh, some interpretation of what this definition is actually saying. One hint towards this direction is the fact that we uh, usually refer to elements of T as open sets. So what we're doing when we're um, defining a topological space is we're designating certain subsets of that space to be open. And now the three um, axioms we're satisfying are saying that, well, the entire space and the empty set need to be open sets. The second one is saying that if we have some finite collection of open sets, then their intersection also needs to be open. And finally, if we have some arbitrary collection of open sets, then their union needs to be open. This might sound familiar to you because if we take X to be, say, the real line, then we can think about um, its open sets um, according to the traditional definition we make in analysis. So that a set is open if for every point in that set we can find a small um, interval with, uh, with epsilon that still um, fits inside that set. For example, the open interval from A to B would be an open set, but we could also have uh, arbitrary unions of such intervals and those would still be open. So in the case where we have uh, the real line and we choose this collection T to be our usual notion of open sets of the real line, then these three axioms are satisfied. So X, the entire space, the real line is open, and the empty set is open. And moreover, uh, you might know from, from like an analysis course that finite intersections of open sets are again open, and that we can take arbitrary unions of open sets and still have that be open. So the definition of a topological space is basically a generalization of the properties that the topology on the real line has. So if you're comfortable with thinking about the topology of the real line, so if you know what like open sets are um, on the real line, then you can think of a topological space as being a generalization of that. Maybe if you're less familiar with the topology of the real line, I'll revert back to our general situation where we have a topology on a set X 
and I'll try to um, give some other perspective on what these open sets are trying to convey. Another way to think about what this collection T, that's the topology on X, is doing is it's specifying the neighborhood structure on our space X. So that's a neighborhood. So what do I mean by this? Well, suppose we have some point little x in, in our set x. Then we can think about its surroundings. So we could think about neighborhoods of this point. So all of these things I'm drawing in purple, they are different ways that x has surroundings in the larger space x. So if you want, you could think of this point as being some person or something, and then these neighborhoods, they're something like, maybe like a, a political districts or, or something like that. So a single person might be in different districts um, for different purposes, and then one might ask that if you have some other uh, point in the space, y, if there is a district that both x and y are in. So y might have different neighborhoods from x, so it might have uh, these blue neighborhoods. And then one could ask how the neighborhoods of x and the neighborhoods of y interact with each other. For example, in the way I've drawn it here, there's this neighborhood around y that is separate from this neighborhood here around x. So if these were political districts, then there would be distinct districts where well, one where x would vote and one where y would vote. And now what the topology is specifying is it's specifying these open sets or neighborhoods around each point. And you can imagine that if we have the information about um, what all these different neighborhoods are, then we could think about um, how this makes the global structure of the space look. For example, if we go back to the analogy with the political districts, it might be that there's just one giant district that everyone's in, or it might be very fine, so you might have very many small districts that overlap in complicated ways. And this would then obviously affect how, how each person is uh, positioned in the political system. All right, so with this um, idea of having open sets as neighborhoods around points, we can look at the axioms again. So what they're saying in that case is that the entire space needs to be an open set or a, a neighborhood. So there is always some neighborhood in which uh, each point is located. So we couldn't have some isolated point that isn't located in any neighborhood. Then we also want the empty set to be a neighborhood, although it's not really a neighborhood of any point because there's no point in the empty set. The second axiom states that if we take finite intersections of these neighborhoods, um, then we again get a neighborhood. For example, here if we look at the point x, then I've drawn it as being located in several of these purple neighborhoods. We could think about taking their intersection, so that's what I'm now filling out in purple, and now by the axioms of a topological space, this filled out region would again be a neighborhood of X. This is perhaps where the analogy with the political districts breaks down because if we have two overlapping political districts, then usually the intersection isn't another political district. And finally, the third axiom states that if we have some arbitrary collection of neighborhoods, then the union is also a neighborhood. For example, if I were to take all these purple neighborhoods around X again and take their union, that would be what I'm shading now in purple. And this uh, shaded region would again be a neighborhood of X. Okay, so I've spent some time on this definition because it's, well, it's fundamental. You need to know it um, for everything that's to come. And I think it's, it's kind of uh, not clear what it's supposed to say if you see it for the first time. And hopefully now you have maybe a little more idea of what's going on. And next we'll turn to a bunch of examples so you can see how this works in practice. 
The first example we'll look at is called the discrete topology. And so for this, we can let x be an arbitrary set. And what we do is we set t just to be the power set of x. So this is the power set, i.e. the set of all subsets of x. So in essence, we're saying that every subset of x is an open set. Now to see that this is a topology, we need to check the three axioms. So first of all, our collection t, well, being the power set, actually is a collection of subsets of x. So that's, that's good. Now for the first axiom, x needs to be an element of t, and the empty set needs to be an element of t. But because the power set is a collection of all subsets of x, it in particular includes x itself and the empty set. So the first axiom here is satisfied. Now for the second axiom, we need our collection t to be closed under finite intersections. So we let a1 up through a n be contained in our collection t. And now the question is whether their intersection, so what about the intersection of a i of i starting at 1 going up through n, well, this is again a subset of our set x. But by definition, this means that it's contained in the power set, which is just our collection t. So this implies that this intersection is actually in t. So we've taken some finite uh, number of elements of t, and we've shown that their intersection is again in T. So that means that the second um, axiom for a topology is satisfied. Now, finally, we need to show that T is closed under arbitrary unions. For this, we take some arbitrary collection of subsets of X. So that's an arbitrary number of elements of T. And now we need to show that their union is again in T. But their union, so, is again a subset of X, which implies that the union is in T. And this means that our collection T also satisfies the third axiom for being a topology on X. Because we've taken every subset to be open, this topology isn't really giving us a lot of extra information. However, it does satisfy the three axioms for a topology because we've taken every subset to be open. So in particular, uh, any intersection of subsets is also going to be open and any union of subsets is again going to be open. So maybe I'll just remark that this discrete topology is the finest topology on x. So this means that it has the most open subsets of any topology that we can put on x because we've included all of the subsets to be open sets. In the next example, we'll do the opposite. We'll try to include as few um, subsets of x to be open and the result is called the trivial topology. So again, we let x be an arbitrary set. And now we set the collection t to simply consist of x and the empty set. The reason we're including these two sets is because they have to be in there by the first axiom. So the first axiom requires that x be in the collection t and the empty set be in the collection t. And, well, by the way we've defined t, this is the case. So if we're trying to include as few sets as possible, we at least have to include x and the empty set in order to satisfy the definition. Okay, how about the other two axioms? Well, the second axiom states that 
we need to have um, finite intersections also be in T. For this, we let A1 up through An be elements of T, and we consider the intersection over these Ai. So here we basically have two cases. So if there is some Ai which is equal to the empty set, well, then the intersection over all the Ai's is going to be the empty set. But this is fine since the empty set is an element of our collection T. On the other hand, if none of the Ai are the empty set, so that's for all i, we don't have that Ai as the empty set, well, then the intersection only consists of the element x, and so it'll be equal to x. And this is again an element of t, so that's fine. So with that, we verified the second axiom. Now for the third axiom, we need our collection t to be closed under arbitrary unions. And here, the argument is pretty much the same. We take some arbitrary collection of elements of t, and now we again do a distinction of cases. So if one of the ai's is equal to x for some i, well, then the union over all the ai's is going to be equal to x because any other ai is contained in x. But x is again an element of t, so we're fine. On the other hand, if all of the ai are not uh, equal to x, so that's if the ai are uh, distinct from x for all i, well then all of the ai have to be the empty set, so then the union of all the ai is just equal to the empty set, and again this is an element of t, so we're fine. And this shows that the third axiom also holds. With this, we've seen two examples of topologies that we can put on any set. So we have the discrete topology, which is the finest topology we can put on a set. And then we have this trivial topology, which is the coarsest topology on uh, the set X. So that means that it includes the fewest open sets that we could possibly include. For our next example, we'll be more explicit and um, basically construct a very simple example that we can draw on the page. So here we let z be the set containing 1, 2, and 3, and then we write down um, our collection t explicitly to be the following set of subsets of z. At this point, we can maybe make a small sketch of the situation. So we have a set z, which consists of the numbers 1, 2, and 3, and now I can draw in the open sets, so that's the elements of t. So we have this uh, set just containing 1, then we have a set containing 1 and 2, and then we have the set containing all of the elements 1, 2, and 3, and finally we have the empty set, which I'm not going to draw. Now let's verify that this is actually a topology on Z. So first, we need to check that the entire space Z is contained in uh, our topology and that the empty set is contained in the topology. But we can see the way we've constructed our topology, uh, both Z and the empty set are included. So in fact, uh, this first axiom is satisfied. For the second axiom, we need to check that um, our topology is closed under finite intersections. Here we basically just have to do a case analysis. So if our collection were to contain the empty set, then the intersection uh, would be the empty set. So that's as in the previous example, and the empty set is uh, contained in our topology, so that would be fine. So we can assume that the empty set is not one of the elements that we're taking the intersection of. So this leaves three elements uh, that we'd have to check all combinations of. 
And so that's the set containing 1, the set containing 1 and 2, and the set containing 1, 2, and 3. However, because each one of these is a subset of the next, um, it's pretty uh, immediate to see that, in fact, if we take intersections, we always get um, the smallest set of that chain of subsets. So for example, if we take the intersection of uh, 1, so this, this first set, uh, the set containing 1 and 2, and the last set, then the result is just going to be the set containing 1, which is again in T. So here we, as I said, we observe that the set containing 1 is a subset of the set containing 1 and 2, which is a subset of the set containing 1, 2, and 3. So if we take any, uh, well, number of these sets, then their intersection will just be the lowest subset in this chain. But because each member of this chain of subsets is in T, it means that the intersection will be, again, an element of T. Now, for the third axiom, we need to check that T is closed under arbitrary unions. And basically, the analogous argument holds where we consider uh, combinations of elements of T. Now, if this collection contains the entire set Z, then the union will be uh, Z, which is an element of T, so that would be fine. So here we just need to consider the chain of subsets. One, uh, the empty set contained in the set only containing one, which is contained in the set that contains one and two. Now, if we take any combination of these sets and take their union, well, the result is going to be the subset that's um, highest in the chain that's contained in that in the well in the ones we've chosen. For example, if we uh, choose the empty set and the subset containing 1, then the result of the union will be the subset containing 1. Thus, again, because these uh, subsets are linearly ordered under inclusion, it means that, uh, well, any union of elements of, these, uh, of this chain will again be in the chain, so uh, in particular it'll be an element of our topology. So with that, I'll declare that also the third axiom holds. I mean, if this chain argument didn't convince you, then you can also just explicitly uh, write down all the combinations and you'll see that uh, it's closed under unions and intersections. Okay, our next example is maybe more useful. So that's uh, the metric topology. And this is in fact the topology that you might be familiar with from uh, the real line or more generally from Euclidean space Rn. So we let MD be any metric space So as a quick reminder, a metric space is just a set that is equipped with this distance function d that uh, gives the distance between any two points of that set. And this distance function has to satisfy certain axioms. For example, it has to be symmetric. So the distance between x and y needs to be equal to the distance between y and x. Um, it has to uh, spit out non-negative values. And the value should be for the distance should be zero if and only if the points are the same uh, point. And finally, the distance function also needs to satisfy the triangle inequality. And um, if we have such a distance function on a set, then we call it a metric space. Now we need to say what our topology is going to be. So we let T be the collection of open sets in the usual metric space sense. Okay, what do I mean by this? Well, we say that a set, let's call it uh, A, is open if for every point in A, there is an epsilon greater zero such that 
the epsilon ball of radius, well, epsilon around the point x is still contained in A. This is just the, the same definition that one has for open sets, for example, of the real line. So pictorially, if we have some set A, then this is open if we take some point x, so this is an arbitrary point, we need to be able to find some small um, epsilon uh, ball around x that is still contained entirely in the set A. If this is possible for every point of A, then after we say that A is open and included in our collection T. Notice that this definition only makes sense for metric spaces because we need um, to be able to form these epsilon balls and this is only possible if we actually have a metric on space which gives us distance between points because this epsilon ball is defined uh, to be the set of all y in our larger space m such that the distance between x and y um, is strictly less than epsilon. Now if we specialize this to the case where uh, m is just the real line, then we can take the distance function to be the absolute value between the difference of two points, and then this gives us the usual notion of open subsets of the real line. And as we see here, this procedure works more generally for any metric space. Now I'm not going to show that the collection T that we get from uh, specifying open sets in this way actually satisfies the axioms of a topology. This is something, at least for um, the case where we're looking at the real numbers, that is usually done in like a calculus or analysis course. But basically what one has to do is one has to um, use the axioms of a metric space uh, in order to check the three axioms of the topology. With this, we've now already seen several examples of topological spaces. And before concluding, I'd like to introduce some notation for uh, spaces that we'll commonly encounter. The first such space is the unit interval, which I'll denote i, and this is a subset of the real numbers. And it's defined just as the closed interval from zero to one. So that's all the points, x and r, such that zero is less than equal to x is less than equal to one. From now on, when I just write i, it's gonna denote the unit interval. Next, we have the unit uh, ball in n dimensions. So that's a subset of Rn, and we'll denote it by this b with superscript n. And this is the set of all vectors x and rn, which have norm strictly less than one. Here, this norm is just the Euclidean norm, so that's the square root of the first coordinate squared plus and so on up to the nth coordinate squared. And notice that because we have this strict inequality, this is actually the open unit ball. Next, we define the unit circle, which I'll denote by S1. And this is a subset of the plane R2. And S1 is defined as all the points, x in R2, whose norm is precisely equal to one. So this is, uh, if we draw R2, this is exactly the unit circle around the origin. And finally, we can generalize the idea of this unit circle to n dimensions as follows. So we let Sn be a subset of Rn plus 1. So note that in the case of the unit circle, we think of it as a one-dimensional entity. So we write S1, but it's actually sitting in uh, R2. And more generally, if we have the unit n-sphere, which would be n-dimensional, it would be sitting in an n plus 1 dimensional space. And we make the analogous definition to uh, what we had above for the unit circle. We just say that this is all the points x in Rn plus 1, such that the norm of x is precisely equal to 1. 
for example, in the case where n equals 2, uh, this would just give us back the usual idea of a sphere in R3. With that, I'm done with what I wanted to say in this video. Next time, we'll be looking at the idea of closed sets and their properties.